Well, good morning and welcome to our service of morning prayer on this first Sunday of Lent. And today I'll introduce a new Lenten sermon series called The Meaning of the Cross. So welcome once again, and if you do have your prayer book handy, we're going to begin this morning on page 76. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We'll continue on page 79 with the confession. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. And the Vanity is found on page 82. Come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. And our psalm appointed for today, this first Sunday of Lent, is Psalm 32. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with a bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. 
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And our first lesson is from Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths. For themselves. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our second lesson is taken from Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned, Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson today is taken from Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus was baptized, he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, 
For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, our Lenten sermon series is entitled, The Meaning of the Cross. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, when you read a biography of someone's life, what's the, what's the usual pattern? Well, you invariably learn about where and when this person who's the subject of the biography was born. If you were reading a biography of my life, you'd read that Doug Gray was born two months premature on November 11th, 1961, at four pounds, four ounces at Riverview Hospital in Red Bank, New Jersey. Well, that's about it, not much more to say about that segment of my life than that. In the vast majority of biographies, you'll hear about the person's most significant accomplishments and achievements, and usually that information concerns their adult years. And then perhaps right at the end, there are a few lines or perhaps a paragraph at most about the person's death and the events surrounding that death. Now, why is there typically so little about a person's death? Well, because in most cases, a person's death is not what defines them. In the vast majority of, of cases, information about a person's death really doesn't add very much to the story. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in a sense, are four separate biographies of Jesus' life. Now, a gospel is much more than a biography, but they're like biographies nonetheless. The gospels are written from four different perspectives. They bring out many of the same points about this person called Jesus of Nazareth. However, here's the interesting thing. Unlike most biographies, the biography of Jesus' life doesn't mention his death as a mere afterthought. It's abundantly clear in each of the Gospels that the death and resurrection of Jesus is the main point. Everything else, his birth, his life, his teaching, even his three years of ministry is secondary. In fact, you know, some scholars have called Mark's Gospel a passion narrative with an extended introduction. So the question is why? Why is Jesus' death so radically different from the death of any other individual who's ever lived? Why is Jesus' death more important than any other aspect of his life, short of the resurrection? Now, if you think this emphasis on the death of Jesus is a point that only the gospel writers stress in the New Testament and nobody else, listen once again to what Paul says in his first letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, by the way, 1 Corinthians was written prior uh, to at least three of the four Gospels. And here's what it says. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Friends, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, 
you know that it's a really long letter. In 1 Corinthians, Paul has a lot to say. And I suspect that he's got a lot to say when he makes his pastoral visit to the church there in person. But what Paul is saying is this, when you understand the centrality of the cross, why Jesus died, why he was up there, it's only then that the message of Christ and everything else we read in the New Testament begins to make sense. Yeah, I believe that's what Paul means when he says to the church, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so the question is, why is this one event, Jesus' crucifixion, so important? And what did Jesus' death on the cross accomplish? And so I'd like to share several things Christ's death accomplished, not just for the world out there, but for you and for me. I'm borrowing at this point from a good article written by Matt Perman on this subject. And in this message today, I'll hopefully provide a kind of overview for our entire series. I'm going to use some uh, fancy and perhaps not so fancy theological terms along the way. But as I do that, I'll try to define the terms as I go, I'll tell you what I mean. And so the first thing Christ's death did was to provide expiation for our sins. Psalm 32 from our readings today, happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. That's expiation. Now, expiation is very much like forgiveness, but really it's much more than forgiveness, at least in the sense that we might think about it. Expiation means the actual removal of our sin and guilt. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist says about Jesus, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in Hebrews 9, 26, it says, it's talking about Jesus, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so what's so vital to understand about Christ's death providing expiation for our sins? Well, here's the key. When our sin is expiated as a result of what Jesus does on the cross, that means it's not merely that God now overlooks our sin. It's much more than that. God takes our sin upon himself. So it's as if we never had it in the first place. He takes it away. Now, from time to time, you'll hear skeptics, uh, people who are not followers of Jesus, say things like, sin and guilt are just figments of our imagination. They say, the reason that you're feeling guilty is because you're all bound up by the things that your family taught you growing up and your church and all of that. But they say these things are all arbitrary. Your feeling of guilt and separation is not real. So you need to do no more about what you perceive to be your sin and guilt than, than kind of think differently about it. In other words, you'll be okay, so just don't worry, be happy. It's really not that bad. But the Bible says our sin is real. The Bible says that we really have broken God's law, and as a result, we're separated from a holy God. It says our guilt is not just make-believe. It's not a figment of our own imagination, but something that God has placed in us to indicate that we've got a serious problem, and we need to do something about it. Then there are those who believe in God, they believe in Jesus, but who say, really, this idea that Jesus needed to die for us so that we might be forgiven, ah, that's just a bit out there. After all, they say God could just kind of maybe wave his wand of forgiveness over everybody and say, I forgive you, and that's it. However, you know, if something like this happened in our daily lives, we'd be up in arms about the injustice of it all. For instance, let's just say, God forbid, 
a man decides to go into an airport with a bomb. He detonates the bomb, he kills scores of innocent people, and he gets caught and arrested. There are hundreds of eyewitnesses. And so he goes to court, he comes before the judge, and the judge hears the case, he hears from the eyewitnesses, and the defendant is cle clearly guilty. The defendant, even in this case, admits his guilt. So instead of imposing a harsh sentence that suits the crime, the judge says to the defendant, it's your lucky day. Why? Because I'm a loving judge. Oh, I believe you committed the crime and hundreds or thousands of innocent people died because of your selfish act, but I'm a loving judge. And I'm going to set you free right here and right now. If this friends happen in real life, people would be up in arms. Thousands would, would order that the judge be disbarred. They demand justice because justice has to be served. And it's the same with God. God is loving, yes, but he's also just. And his justice demands that someone pay for the crime that's been committed. That's why God, even though he's a loving God, can't just wave his, his heavenly wand of forgiveness over everyone, saying, I forgive you, without dealing with people's biggest problem, our sin. Next, Jesus' death has provided reconciliation. Now, uh, that's a word that most of us are more familiar with. So again, the Bible is clear that our sin has separated us from a holy God. Christ's death removed this alienation and thus reconciled us with God. We see this in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Next, Jesus' death has provided redemption. The price that is paid to deliver someone from captivity is called a ransom. And to say that Christ's death accomplished redemption for us means that it accomplished deliverance from our captivity through the payment of a price. The truth is our sin incurred a debt that not one of us is capable of paying with our own resources. God looks at each of our spiritual bank accounts, if you will, and they each come up marked insufficient funds. And so Christ paid a debt that we couldn't possibly pay, no matter how hard we try, no matter how many good works we perform. Next, Christ's death achieved for us a victory. And it was a victory, the Bible says, over the powers of darkness. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, talking about Jesus once again, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And the final term of what Christ accomplished on the cross that we'll cover today is best described as the self-substitution of God. Jesus accomplished all of these benefits that I spoke about today by dying in our place. That is, by dying instead of us. Now, we deserve to get out and die. And he took our sin upon himself and paid the ultimate price on our behalf. And that's what it means that Christ died for us when Paul talks about that in Roman and gave himself for us. He says that in Galatians chapter 2. As Isaiah says, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him, Isaiah says. And I'll end today with a quote from John Stott, which I really encourage you to think about and perhaps reflect on in the week ahead. Here's what he says. 
as the essence of sin is us substituting ourselves for God, so the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, if you have your prayer book handy, have you turned to the second song of Isaiah, it's Canticle 10, it's found on page 86 of the Book of Common Prayer. Seek the Lord while he wills to be found. Call upon him when he draws near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the evil ones their thoughts. And let them turn to the Lord and he will have compassion. And to our God, for he, for he will richly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as rain and snow fall from the heavens, and return not again, but water the earth, bringing forth life and giving growth, seed for sowing and bread for eating, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I have purposed and prosper in that for which I sent it. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And Canticle 14, a song of penitence, is found at the bottom of page 90. O Lord and ruler of the hosts of heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of all their righteous offspring, you made the heavens and the earth with all their vast array. All things quake with fear at your presence. They tremble because of your power. But your merciful promise is beyond all measure. It surpasses all that our minds can fathom. O Lord, you are full of compassion, long-suffering, and abounding in mercy. You hold back your hand. You do not punish as we deserve. In your great goodness, Lord, you have promised forgiveness to sinners that they may repent of their sin and be saved. And now, O Lord, I bend the knee of my heart and make my appeal sure of your gracious goodness. I have sinned, O Lord, I have sinned, and I know my wickedness only too well. Therefore, I make this prayer to you. Forgive me, Lord, forgive me. Do not let me perish in my sin nor condemn me to the depths of the earth. For you, O Lord, are the God of those who repent, and in me you will show forth your goodness. Unworthy as I am, you will save me in accordance with your great mercy. And I will praise you without ceasing all the days of my life. For all the powers of heaven sing your praises, and yours is the glory to ages of ages. Amen. The Apostles' Creed is found on page 96. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And, as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you as eternal life and to serve you as perfect freedom, defend us, your humble servants, in all the assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. And our prayer list today, we pray for St. David's in Columbia. We also pray for the Scottish Episcopal Church. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you all who have died, that their deaths may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. And we pray for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. And may their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. We pray for Retta Miller, Marcine Thompson, Chubby Rice, Sally Wiseman, Nancy Malding, Lindsay Presley, Eve Daniel, Harriet Strait, Marilyn Zurgatis, the people of Ukraine, and those in Syria and Turkey affected by the recent earthquake. For birthdays, we celebrate Crosby Adams, Joy Paget, Carl Thaler, Francis Wishart, Gladys Robertson, James Newcomb. And we pray for those in our military. We pray for their safety. We pray for their provision. For Brian Dugan, Edward and Katie Cloyd, Alexander, Isaac, Natalie, and Gavin White. 
And let us pray for our own needs and those of others. The general thanksgiving is on page 101. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.